Hey, so in this video, we'll be solving the Schrodinger equation to find the allowed wave functions and energies for a particle that moves along the x-axis and it's trapped inside a box. Now, the wave function psi represents what's actually oscillating in a matter wave. And remember that psi squared is equal to the probability density function of um, the particle we're investigating. So it psi squared will tell us how likely it is to find a particle somewhere. And E just represents the energy of the particle um, when it's trapped inside the box. And it might be a bit counterintuitive to think of a particle moving along a one-dimensional axis trapped in a box, which is typically three-dimensional. But um, in quantum mechanics, when we use the word box to refer to a discrete or discontinuous or sudden jump in potential energy. So if we plot potential against the x-axis, Say we have a box going from x equals 0 all the way to x equals L. Um, the potential for the particle would look like it would be constant during or while the, while the particle is inside the box. And since we can set our zero line wherever we want it to, for convenience, we'll set it to zero. Um, just like in classical mechanics, we can set our zero line for potential. And outside the box, it would be infinitely high. So... I'll just draw these dashed lines to indicate that it's infinitely high. So that's what our potential function would look like for this particle. So because we've set v to zero, we can actually tidy up the differential equation a bit. So we can write it down as the second derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to, and I'll change color here just to make it a bit obvious is equal to minus 2m e over h bar and remember h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi squared so it'll be that thing times by um, psi because v is 0 so what we have here is pretty reminiscent of the simple harmonic motion equation because you have the second derivative of a quantity being proportional and in opposite direction to the first derivative of that quantity psi. So we, should, we, we shouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing sines or cosines because this is basically just the simple harmonic motion equation from classical mechanics. So now we can solve this by writing out the characteristic equation in terms of a dummy variable, which we'll call lambda. So say we have, so the, the characteristic equation for this um, differential equation would be lambda squared equals minus 2m e over h bar squared. And the reason this is, is because um, this is an ordinary differential equation in terms with constant coefficients, so coefficients that don't depend on x. So this thing in green here is, the is you can think of it as the eigenfunction of psi, the eigenvalue of psi with respect to this second derivative operator, because when, because this equation is telling us that the second derivative of psi is basically equal to psi times by this constant and whenever whenever we have the scaling um we can say that the thing that gets scaled is the eigenfunction psi and the thing it's getting scaled by is its eigenvalue okay so um solving for lambda here we can see that this would imply lambda is equal to plus or minus root of 2me over h bar, but remember uh, lambda squared was a negative number, so this would be a complex uh, root. So we have two distinct complex roots for our characteristic equation. So that means um, our general solution for psi would look like some amount of sine um, this thing over here. So let's just, let's just call this constant k kx plus some amount of co cosine kx and remember I've just relabeled k to equal um, 
the square root of 2 me over h bar okay so now we can so now we have the general solution for psi we can work out um, a and b so so we'll work out a and b using the boundary conditions on psi so we know that um if i just sketch out our um our potential function again we know that at x equals 0 and x equals l, the probability of finding the particle should be 0 because um, that's where the potential starts to go to infinity and psi needs to be a continuous function. So that tells us that psi at x equals 0 is equal to psi at x equals l and, that, and they must both be 0. So from the first condition, psi at x equals 0 well, remember, psi was just some amount a sine kx plus some other amount b cos kx. If you plug in x equals 0, you get b equals 0. So now we found what b was. So now we can plug in our second boundary condition that psi of l, which is equal to a sine kl um and the cause term disappears now because we found out that um b is equal to zero so sine of so psi of l is equal to zero so now this gives us two possibilities either Either um, this this implies that a equals zero, and if a equals zero, that means psi is zero for all values of x, and that just means there is no particle because our probability distribution function is always zero. Or this means that sine kl is zero. So now if sine kl is zero, well sine is only zero whenever its argument or input is an integer multiple of uh, pi. So that means kl can equal zero or can equal plus or minus pi or plus or minus two pi and so on. So kl is equal to n pi where n is an integer. In fact, we can restrict n to just positive integers because sine um, sine is an odd function. So, sine of minus x is equal to minus sine x. So, if um, we put in a negative integer, we could change it into a positive one, and the negative sign would just get absorbed into the constant a. So, uh, what we can say from here is l. Uh, I'm sorry, k. Is equal to n pi over l because l is um, just a number so now we know uh, what k is we can rewrite our wave function we can rewrite it as psi is equal to a sine instead of writing k we can now write n pi over l x where n is a positive integer so now um we use the boundary conditions and we got rid of one of our constants b but we still have this constant and we can we can uh, solve for a using another condition um a normalization condition on probability which is a fancy way of saying look the particle must be somewhere on the x-axis so if we um, integrate the probability distribution function over the x-axis the answer we should get is 1 so if we integrate um, the PDF so mathematically that means the integral of the PDF from, from negative infinity to positive infinity is always equal to 1 and since we know the particle must be in the box this means that the integral from 0 to L of psi squared, the PDF, is equal to 1. 
So now uh, we can just plug in psi into this integral and what we get is the integral from 0 to L of a squared sine squared n pi x over L dx is equal to 1. Now this might look like a nasty integral, but um, we can deal with it. The way we work this out is, firstly, notice that this is a constant. It doesn't depend on um, x, so we can just factor it out of the integral. And then we have to integrate sine squared. So to integrate sine squared, we can use the trig identity, which I'll bring up on the screen. Um, sine squared of x is equal to one half minus a half cos 2x so sine squared of this thing over here is the same as one half minus a half cos 2 of this thing over here this is why you learn trick identities um and that is dx and that's um equal to one so now this we can integrate so first let's take out the half to make things look neater. Half's also a constant, just like a squared. Integral from zero to L. In fact, I could just do the integral. So that times, um, if we integrate one, we'd get X. And if we integrate cos of two times something, we'd get, well, first we'd take out all of the constant coefficients, 2 and pi, and cos integrates to sine. 2 and pi x over L. And our integration limits are 0 and L, and we know that's equal to 1. Right. Now to work out the integral. So if we plug in x equals L, we'd get, well, there'd still be that constant on the outside, times by inside the bracket. So um, x would just turn to L, sine of n pi would always be 0, because it's a um, sine of pi. Um, so um, the next one, when we plug in x equals 0, we get 0, and sine of 0, that is also 0. So what this is equal to is the absolute value of a squared over 2 um, times by L. And we know that is equal to 1. So this means that the absolute value of a squared is equal to 2 over L. So now, um, looking at this, you'd think that there's only two results we can get from this. We can, we can say that, right, so a must be equal to plus or minus the square root of 2 over L. But remember, a is a parameter we've set, and it can be complex as well. So a can also be equal to plus or minus the root of 2 over L times I. Um, but A has no physical meaning, it's just a parameter we put in. So we can, in essence, use any of these four values. But to keep things simple, we'll, we'll take A to equal the square root of 2 over L. Nice, positive, and real. So now if we plug that into Psi, we get Psi of X is equal to the square root of 2 over L sine n pi x over L. And that is our wave function. You see it depends on this parameter n, which is a positive number. So that means we can we can call this psi n of x. So it's the um, 
it's the wave function where we set the parameter of n to whatever we want. So that means psi 1 of x would look like the square root of 2 over L sine, and we've set n to 1, so it would just be pi x over L. So we found psi n of x, this boy over here. Now we can we can also find um, en, the corresponding energy when the particle is at psi n. And the way we do that is, so remember how we set um, k to equal the square root of 2me divided by h bar? Well, we can rearrange this for e and see that e is equal to h bar squared k squared divided by 2m and now we know what k is because we've solved from before and found out that k is n pi over l so if we plug that value for k into this expression for e we get e is equal to um n squared pi squared h bar squared divided by 2m l squared and again we've got this equation for e and e depends on n so we can call this e n so the energy of um the particle we're dealing with uh, depends on this parameter n where n is a positive integer um when you deal with cases like say the hydrogen atom in three dimensions and stuff um this number n is called the principal quantum number which um if you've done any chemistry before you real um is really the same thing as the shell number in layman's terms so our final answers to the question are psi n is equal to the square root of 2 over L sine of n pi x over L and en is equal to n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2m L squared and in both these cases n is a positive integer and that is our solution. We have solved the one-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation. So time-independent means it's constant energy. And I'll put up some of the solutions on the screen to show you what the probability distributions look like. And I hope you found this video helpful.